my confidence is not based on any thought that there will be easy agreement or consensus if we have a more morally robust civic engagement. In fact, I'm not even sure that consensus or agreement is a reasonable ambition. But I do think it is a way to a richer democratic life and a, a better kind of public deliberation that might be able, over time, to <coughs> diminish the influence of the attack ads and of the food fights on cable television. The, the idea that, that uh, markets can then extend to, let's say, politics, that you have the marketplace of politics, market fundamentalism, which I define as the extension of market values to areas where it doesn't belong, has done tremendous damage and is, in fact, endangering our, our open society. I think there's also a second reason, second respect in which markets are not amoral. They're not morally neutral instruments. Economists often assume, and market enthusiasts often assume, that to buy and sell a good may raise distributional questions, but it's otherwise neutral with respect to that good. The idea is that markets are inert instruments for the buying and selling of things. But in certain domains of life, that's not true. Markets leave their mark on the goods they exchange especially in areas of life, spheres of social life, where nonprofit organizations have a very important role. I think it's important to draw a distinction between being a market participant and being a citizen. So, so um, I, I live by that. I mean, I, I practice what I preach. Mm -hmm. In other words, I think we ought to I, I think that our political uh, system would function better if people made that distinction. And I make that distinction. I'm willing to, uh, pro uh, uh, let's say, promote legislation that might hurt my interest mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, uh, as a market participant, mm -hmm. because that's the common good, and that's legislation. But in the market, I have no hesitation in trying to maximize uh, uh, the profit that I make and uh, <laughs> to the extent I want to use the money to uh, promote the public interest. That's my choice. So, so I think uh, very few people do that. It's a rather scarce uh, commodity. So uh, uh, while uh, I, I feel definitely outgunned uh, by the by the other side, uh, I feel that uh, my money has a certain scarcity value and that gives me satisfaction. <laughs> the daycare centers had a problem with parents coming late to pick up their children. A teacher had to stay afterwards to look after the children whose parents didn't come on time. So the economists did an experiment. They said, charge people who come late, charge them a fine if they come and pick up their children late. So the daycare centers instituted the fine. And what do you suppose happened? Late pickups increased. <laughs> now, from the standpoint of standard market reasoning, this is puzzling. <laughs> you give a monetary penalty or incentive, an incentive to come on time, but the late pickups increases rather than decreases. Now, how could this be? Well, I think that this is what happened. There was a norm before that you pick up your children on time, and if you don't, you are imposing on somebody else. And that created a sense of obligation and even guilt if you were late. <coughs> now, when it's marketized, People think, well, I'm paying for a service. <laughs> and the norm of showing up to spare someone the trouble, that norm, a non-market norm, is eroded or dissolved or undermined, crowded out by a market norm. 
I call it the enlightenment fallacy, the, the belief that, that, uh, that uh, uh, thinking is directed at understanding reality and uh, getting at the truth, the pursuit of truth. And in politics, that's not the case. Right. Uh, the, it's the pursuit of success. You want to get elected, yeah. and you, you, you twist facts. You don't, uh, you don't necessarily respect facts. Uh, so, uh, and the techniques of manipulation uh, have been so highly developed that ma it makes it even more difficult to figure out uh, what's right and wrong. At markets, and we have to look case by case. We need to have empirical studies about the effects of markets in various areas of social life, social practices. This would be a great research topic for the Hauser Center, <laughs> among others. <laughs> but my worry is that markets are not neutral in this further sense that they can crowd out non-market norms, which can include moral norms, civic norms that we should care about, should care about, want to shore up, rather than erode or dissolve. There are very few uh, philanthropies uh, that actually have a, a philanthropist behind it that provides it with money. So they actually have to raise money. And in order to raise money, uh, they have to uh, gain attention, uh, convince people, sell. They have to sell their philanthropy. And that uh, takes a lot of money. And it also uh, often forces you into doing things for the sake of uh, uh, self-promotion um, uh, rather than doing the mission that you are claiming that you're doing. The intermediate associations that we call the nonprofit sector or civil society can be instruments for cultivating a certain kind of civic virtue, calling people out of their own self-interested preoccupations and orienting them to a larger good greater than themselves. Now, it may not be the larger good of the entire national community. It may be a more particular good. <clears throat> but Tocqueville had this idea when he looked at American democracy. He talked about the township. But civil society generally in the nonprofit sector can perform this role whether it involves health or education um, or other uh, forms of civil society, of getting people in the habit through actual local practices, drawing them out of a, a concern for their own interests solely, and getting them in the habit of caring about a common good larger than themselves. And that makes, that's an essential ingredient, I think, for the kind of citizenship that could possibly create a public deliberation that goes beyond manipulation and sound bites and food fights on talk radio.